let that distract you tonight. Uh, welcome back. Uh, if you're with us for the first time tonight, we're delighted that you are here, and we welcome you tonight. Uh, wanted to say, uh, next week is a reminder, just a reminder, we won't meet here next week on October the 10th. Uh, I'll be preaching a revival. I, I just did a revival service last night at Mount Bethel. I'll be doing a revival service at Harmony Baptist on Saturday night. And then I'm going to get a revival in Moxville October 10th through our night through the 11th at Liberty United Methodist Church. And so I'll be over there. I invite y'all to come and join us uh, for that revival over there on uh, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, or any, any of those days. You're welcome to come and join us. Uh, just keep that in mind. We won't meet next week, and we won't meet on October 31st. That's on Monday this year because we have a trunk or treat uh, here at the church. So just keep that in mind as well. But uh, again, welcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for all the, the wonderful food and uh, all the work you put into that tonight. We thank you very much. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, y'all. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Bible study tonight, and we thank you for your holy word. And we just ask, Lord, that you fill this place tonight with your presence and make it known to us and help us and guide us in our study of your word tonight. Illumine our minds and fill our hearts tonight and equip us in our hands and feet, Lord, to act on what we have heard. Uh, to be people called by your name and equipped by your word and empowered by your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. So tonight we're going to talk about what are we saved from? And then what are we saved for? There'll be a couple other things in between. But I've got a friend, He's a, he's been ministry a long time. He actually retired, but he's still doing some uh, ministry uh, part-time and doing some evangelistic uh, type work and, and writing some books. But uh, he says he doesn't like to use the word saved a lot of times in certain circumstances and certain uh, uh, crowds because he said that word is so misunderstood uh, nowadays and it has a lot of negative connotations for people or it can be, even be offensive. And I don't think that we should abandon the word saved. I just think we need to teach it and understand it in all of its fullness. Because it is a term that can be misunderstood. So we don't want to uh, sell it short. And we certainly don't want to just dismiss it altogether. But we don't want to misunderstand it. But I want you to think about right now, just for a few minutes, Think about what does it mean, and make sure you have your hand out in front of you. If you, don't, you need something to write with, there's some pens here and there on the tables, and if you need, there's extras here and there. But there's a question on your hand out, and it says, what does it mean to you to be saved? Just think about that for a minute, and just kind of jot something down, some of your thoughts there for just a second. Please uh, help yourself to desserts or whatever you uh, need out there on the table. We've got some delicious desserts out there tonight. Just think about what does it mean to you to be saved? Just kind of, kind of jot down a couple of thoughts there. Smoke's come out some ears. All right. All right, look at your handout. I've got the passage from Ephesians chapter 2 uh, laid out here for us. And uh, read along with me as I'm reading this out loud. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked 
following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. <coughs> By grace you have been saved, and raised up with Him, and seated, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so, no one, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what I want you to do uh, right now is just read through that again on your own, just briefly, and then answer those questions I've got for you right there. According, number one, according to this passage, what is it that God saves people from? And then number two, fill in the blank. We are saved by blank, through blank, for blank, blank. <laughs> So what is it that God saves people from? What is it that God saves people from? Death. Death. Disobedience to Him. Disobedience to Him. What else? Did I hear that? I heard, I heard, I thought I heard of it. Trespasses and sins. Trespasses and sins. Yep. How about number two there? We are saved by grace. All right. Saved by grace. Grace means what God has done for us. Something that we could never do for ourselves. Something we could never do for ourselves. Because if you're dead, how much can you really do for yourself? Not too much, right? So for by grace we have been saved through what? Faith. Through faith. Through faith. By grace, through faith. For. And Jonelle just gave it away. But that's it, right? Everybody agree with that? For good work. So, very good. Very good. So, what I want you to do now is just take a little bit of time. In the time that we have spent together so far, we've talked about the importance of context. We've talked about the storyline of God's uh, plan of salvation and God's dealings with humanity and God's purposes for His creation. Uh, so I want you to just talk with the folks around you. And uh, maybe Johnny and Leanne get together here with uh, Joe Nell and uh, Janine and uh, talk about your favorite movie 
favorite movie and uh, what, how you would, if, if there's a movie you like or a series of movies, maybe Star Wars movies, and talk about the next sequel that you would like to see, what it would be like. All right? some of the same characters, but not every character would be exactly the same. The storyline would be similar, but it wouldn't be exactly the same. It'd be a little bit different, right? But it would be in harmony with the first movie. So, as Christians, we're called to live into a story. A real, a true story we're called to live into. Our lives should be in harmony with that story. It won't be exactly the same as what came before, it will be similar, and it will be in harmony, it will be in continuity, but there will be some things that are a little bit different. Uh, and this is what we have to understand. This passage we just read is a summary, a summary of a story, a big, huge story that the Bible tells us. There's an underlying story, and it's, it's filled out even further in Romans 1 
through 8. I want to encourage you this between now and the next time we meet, which is two weeks, just read Romans 1 through 8. And it itself is a fuller summary of this smaller summary that we're reading here. But this passage is summing up for us the story of God and the story of humanity and the story of God's creation and God's story of salvation uh, and redemption. The story begins, obviously, in Genesis 1 and chapter 2. And God creates human beings after His likeness and His image. We are all created with tremendous dignity. We've talked a lot about what that really means, especially in comparison to some of the other stories that's been told throughout history, and especially stories that were told in, uh, among the Babylonians and others uh, in the pagan world. But humanity rebelled against the vocation and the purpose for which God created us in Adam and Eve. That's chapter 3. And because of that, humanity fell into the trap of sin. A desperate trap of sin. They, list, they listened to the whispers of the serpent in the garden. They were tempted and they gave in to the temptation and they became enslaved to sin. And they were in now in a world that's in rebellion against its creator, enslaved by sinful desires. Desires of the flesh. If you go back and you look at Genesis 3, you'll see the desires there. Uh, and this is kind of uh, reiterated in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, where 1 John tells us, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these are things that are part of the world, and it's part of the fallen nature of the world. And that's what we're saved from. Right? These corrupt desires. So uh, we want to keep that in mind as part of the story. Genesis uh, 3, uh, I've got that on your handout, shows you the desire. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, a delight to the eyes, and a tree that was to be desired to make one wise. I think that is echoed there in that passage in 1 John chapter 2. Here in Genesis chapter 4, he says, to, he says God says to Cain, when he is angry with his brother Abel, he says, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, here in verse 7 of chapter 4, sin is lurking at the door. Sin is lurking at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Now the warning here is that if Cain doesn't master sin, what's going to happen? Sin's going to master him. And the Bible's telling us that sin has mastered the human race. Now when you think about sin or sins, dead and trespasses and sin, uh, what are the, some of the things that you may think of off the top of your head when you hear the word sin? Wrongdoing. Wrongdoing, okay. Uh, you know something it. that you do wrong, right? You know it. What else? One of the other things the Bible says, uh, it's, it uses a word in the Greek, it's called missing the mark. Missing the mark. Missing the aim of where God really wants our lives to be. Missing the mark. Doing something wrong. But sin is actually described, not just the things that we do wrong, not just the mistakes that we make, but it's described in another way. That the way sin is described there to Cain, it's like it's this, this force, right? That he has to be wary of. It's not just something that he's going to do wrong. It's a power that can overcome him, right? So that's the nature of sin. And when humanity fell in the rebellion in the Garden of Eden, all of us were infected with this thing called sin that causes us to sin, that compels us to sin, that compels us to do wrong, to miss the mark, uh, to walk away from and outside of God's commandments. So... Uh, we have to understand the nature of sin and that it, it corrupts our desires so that we end up wanting the wrong things and desiring the wrong things. That's part of what it is God saves us from. And you see in uh, the second page there of your handout, <coughs> when humanity falls into sin, the Bible tells us that it, it uh, descends into chaos pretty quickly 
And God sends a tremendous judgment. And through Noah, he saves the world. And then he calls this man named Abraham. This, this is the beginning of God's rescue operation. To rescue the world from sin. He calls Abraham and through him, uh, his descendants, through the, the nation of Israel. And he commissions them to keep his commandments similar to the way he commissioned Adam to, and Eve to keep his commandment in the garden. But like Adam before them, Israel failed. And they failed miserably. So you have uh, Romans 5, 19 here. It says, For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. He, here he's talking about the sin of Adam and how Adam, his rebellion uh, caused all of humanity to fall. But in the other half of this verse is talking about this other man. This one man's obedience, this man Jesus Christ, where Adam and Israel failed, Jesus Christ succeeded. God's only son succeeded, and he offered God what Adam, all of humanity in him, and Israel as well in Adam, all failed to offer God, and that was obedience. So through one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So the story of the Bible here is telling us that the hero of the story offered God what everyone else failed to offer him. And through that, through his obedience, the rest of humanity, Israel and all the rest of humanity, as we talked about last week, we'll look at a little bit further here, are through him, through faith in him, are offered forgiveness through his shed blood. And also the ability and the empowerment to then begin to obey by the power of God's Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. We're saved by grace, what Christ has done for us, right? Through faith, we receive it, we access it, and it becomes ours in Him. And then we're saved for something as well, right? We're saved for something. So that it's the power of Christ's self-sacrificial love and humble obedience over self-gratifying desire and prideful rebellion that is the key to our salvation. When we put our trust in Jesus Christ and follow Him, He rescues us from slavery to sin and the courses of a fallen world in an evil age that is characterized by the use and domination of people and the creation for the love of things and pleasures, which at its heart is idolatry. This path puts humanity in the never-ending cycle of God's judgment and wrath that result from living contrary to God's designs and intentions. However, Christ's death and loving obedience results in the forgiveness of sins and deliverance from the power of sin. For those who trust in Him. Those who trust in Him not only receive forgiveness, not only receive the, the new birth through that, and a new heart through that. Now we could, no, we could no more do that for ourselves than we could give ourselves a heart transplant. Okay? That, that's, the, that's the grace part. If you needed a heart transplant, you could not do that for yourself, could you? But through someone else, the hands of someone else, it can be done. That's the grace part. So we're saved by grace through faith, by trusting in what He has done for us. And He saves us for, not only for us to just live a better life in this world, but He saves us for another world, right? He saves us for another world. As soon as we trust in Him, we're not only forgiven, we're also born again, born anew. And as John 3 says, we enter into the kingdom of God, even now. In the midst of a fallen world, in the midst of the kingdoms of the world, a corrupt and a decaying and dying world, we enter into the kingdom of God right now. Through the self-sacrificial love of Jesus the Messiah by grace and by the mercy of God, we receive forgiveness. That's justification. And we receive new birth, which is the beginning of a journey called sanctification. And it's a journey that leads and, and, and it ends in the process called glorification. Glorification in the resurrection of the body in a new heaven 
in a new earth. By God's grace, we are saved from a walk on a wide path in sin and trespasses that leads to destruction. For a walk in holiness and righteousness and good works that leads to eternal life in God's kingdom when it comes all in all of its fullness. So last week, we looked at this on your handout that I gave you a handout of last week. <coughs> Through faith in Christ, by His work on the cross, what He did for us on the cross, through faith in Him, we enter into the covenant community of God. We enter into the new covenant, which was right at the heart of the old covenant from the very beginning. We become a new covenant people and part of the new covenant community, whether we're Jew or whether we're Gentile, part of all the other nations of the world. We enter into this new covenant community. But again, we also enter into the kingdom of of God right now. Not when we die, but right now. We pass from death into life. The new life of the new heaven and the new earth that's not completely here yet, but we enter into that life right now by the power of Christ's blood, His shed blood, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the original traditional Jewish expectation for the hope that they had was that we were living in an evil age, This what the Bible calls this age, which is a, Ephesians also tells us that we're saved from that too. We're saved from the course of a fallen world. Okay? The traditional Jewish, Jewish expectation is that the Messiah would come and would immediately usher in the age to come or the kingdom of God right then and there. But that was actually a misreading of the text, of, of the Bible. Christ came, but He didn't come according to the traditional expectations. He came as a lowly servant who would give His life in self-sacrificial love. That's what saves us. That's what saves us. His self-sacrificial love. He died on the cross. Three days later, He was raised from the dead and eventually ascended back into heaven. But when He came into this world, He brought the kingdom of God with Him. And all those who believe in Him enter into the kingdom right now. Okay? So there's an overlap. You see the overlap here. I've got the little diagram on your handout as well. So we live in the midst of that overlap if we enter into the kingdom of God. We live as citizens... Philippians chapter 3, and it, this is really cool, but in Philippians chapter 3, Paul, it's just a passing comment, but he says, Paul there says, our citizenship is in heaven. It's in heaven. Even right now, we're citizens of the kingdom of God here and now. And we're awaiting the second coming when this age will finally end and there will be nothing but the new heaven and the new earth in the kingdom of God in all of its forms. But even right now, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, what we need to recognize is that we are called to live as citizens of the kingdom even now in the midst of this all of world. And we receive the peace and we receive the joy, not of this age, because this age will not give us that joy, it will not give us this peace, this world, this fallen world. We can have the peace and the joy of the world to come even now. And we do. That's what we have. Uh, one, uh, I think it's Jeremy Bigby, uh, I believe his name is. He's a theologian and he says our hope is not a hope for the world to come. It's a hope from the world to come. We bring that joy and that peace of the new heaven and earth into the here and now, right now. And we live with the power that's available in a measured way. Because it says the Holy Spirit is a down payment in other passages of the New Testament. It's a down payment on our inheritance. So we get a foretaste of that world to come now. And but God right now then begins to fulfill that new covenant promise. That new covenant promise was that He would write His laws where? On our hearts. And it, be 
begins in the here and now. It won't be completed until the resurrection, but it begins now. So this is what uh, a lot of times theologians will call the already, but the not yet. The kingdom is already here. Jesus, when he first started preaching, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? It's already here, but it's not fully come. It's not fully come. So we're when we're thinking about what it is we're saved for, we're saved from a fallen world, and we're saved for a new world, a new creation, a new heaven and earth, what Jesus Christ called the kingdom of God. And we're called to live, to live as new creations now. So the grace of God will affect how we live. So look at page four of your handout, page, the bottom of page three, I'm sorry. So if, if Ephesians is telling us there, verse 2, it says we're saved from following an unholy spirit that it calls the prince of the power of the air. So if we're saved from following an unholy spirit called the prince of the power of the air, then we are saved to be led by the holy what? spirit, right? You can read that in Romans 8.14. If we are saved on page 4, if we are saved from a following our own sinful desires, we are saved for following the blank of blank. What do you think that would be? The will of God. The will of God. We're saved from our own corrupt and fallen desires so that we can follow the will of God. And again, as we rightly guess, we are saved Four good works. We're saved by grace, through faith, but four good works. And we've got to hold all those things together. Some people will emphasize, so emphasize grace that they forget about faith and good works. Or some people will so emphasize good works that they forget about grace. If you emphasize the grace part and forget about all of the others, you have life, You have a license to do whatever you want to do a lot of times. It's the way it's misinterpreted. But if you so emphasize works that you forget about grace, you end up with legalism and trying to earn your salvation, which we don't, right? Which it says we can. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. We're not saved by works, but we are saved for works. So much so... That Titus says this about the grace of God. The grace of God is much bigger than we've given it credit for in the church over many years now. But Titus puts it this way. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. It's, it's for everyone, but it's received by faith, right? Timothy also says that God, uh, Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men, but especially those who believe. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a, a self-controlled, upright, and godly life in the present age. Even, that's, that's the right now part of the kingdom. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the, great, uh, the, of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous. Zealous. What does it mean to be zealous? What are some synonyms? Enthusiastic. Excited. What else? On fire. On fire. I love that. On fire. For what? Good For good works. We should be excited. We should be on fire. But a lot of times in the church, people have been suspicious about any talk of good works. Because as soon as you start saying something about good works, sometimes people will say, well, no, no, no. And I've had this happen a lot. We're, no, no, we're, we're, we're saved by grace. I said, I, I didn't say we weren't. Right? I said, we are saved by grace. Through faith, four good works. And we should be zealous because that's what the grace of God does. It sets us on fire. And what are these good works? What kind of good works? 
John 14, 12 says they're the works that Jesus did. Jesus said himself, they're the works that Jesus did. And even greater, even greater than Jesus did. Jesus said that. Those who believe on me will do the works that I do. And even greater shall they do. I don't think any one of us individually can do that, but all of us working together collectively can do that because guess what we are on earth? We're the body of Christ. God, through the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ working through us, His body on earth. Look at Acts 10, 38 there. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. A lot of people love John 3.16, right? Can anybody tell me John 3.16? Anybody heard that one before? You ever seen it on a sign in a ball game or somewhere? What does it say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah! But we need to also remember 1 John. 1 John 3.16 and 17. It says, By this we know love that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to do what? We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters as well, right? But if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? God saves us God saves us for a new way of life. Some of the translations will actually say that. That we're saved by, by our four good works, that they should be our way of life. The translation I gave you is a more literal translation. And it says that we should walk in them. Have you figured out why I've called this class the walk yet? that we should walk in them, that they should be our way of life. And this new way of life that God saves us for is a kingdom of God way of life. He calls us to live as citizens of the kingdom of God in this fallen world to bring healing and to bring restoration in this world as He works through us, not as we do it in our own power, in our own uh, uh, might, but as He works through us. Now, the guide to what these good works should look like. Uh, there's this guy named Martin Luther who started this thing called the Protestant Reformation. And he emphasized, beginning at the beginning of his ministry, he discovered the doctrine of justification by faith. And it completely changed his life and it completely changed the course of the whole world. And he taught it fervently and he taught it passionately, that we are saved by grace, period. That's God saves us by grace. By grace. And we are justified by what Christ has done for us. We couldn't do it for ourselves anymore than we could give ourselves a heart transplant or any more than we could just raise ourselves from the dead. Right? But people misunderstood what he taught. So he wrote this book that he considered maybe to be one of the most important things he wrote. And it was called The Treatise on Good Works. And in that little book he said this at the beginning of it. Our knowledge of good works must derive from what? God's commandments. And not from the appearance, magnitude, or quantity of the deeds themselves, nor from human opinion, laws, or dealings. So the commandments of God, beginning with the Ten Commandments, which sums up the whole of the moral law, which is still part and parcel of what it means to be a new covenant person, which is the very thing that God writes on our hearts. That was the promise, remember, of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, going back to Deuteronomy 30, is that God would like write His law, His moral law on our hearts so that we would obey the commandments of God should be our guide to these good works for which, for which we are saved. So right now, what I want you to do 
is think about this. And let's brainstorm together as a whole group together real quickly before we get into our small group discussions. 7.15 now. But just real quickly, what are some of the good works that we should be zealous for and some of the good works that we should be seeing and doing in our personal lives, in our families, in our marriages, in our church, in the community we're in, and even in the broader world? What are some of the good works that we should be zealous for? So uh, think about the fourth question, what can we do together as a group between now and Christmas? It doesn't have to be between now and Christmas, but maybe that's a good time. There's a lot, of, a lot of things going on and a lot of opportunity to do good for people. So think about that fourth question as a group together. And I want to leave you uh, with this, a couple things. Uh, Eugene Peterson talking about uh, how we're a part of the kingdom of God now. He says the church is a colony of heaven in a country of death. The church. When we're in the church, we're a colony of heaven in a country of death. And the, the main thing I want to get across tonight is we're not just saved for our own sake. Our own selves individually. If you go back to the promise that God made to Abraham, Genesis 12, that he was going to bless Abraham so that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed, right? We're not saved for our own sakes. We're saved for the sake of others to continue to do the works of Jesus Christ, to bring healing and restoration into people's lives, into communities, into churches that need it today. All of these things we're called to. Jesus says this about his people. And he's saying this to us here tonight. Hear it as if it's not just to those disciples that he was talking to way back then. Think about it as he's talking to you and me tonight. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a stand... And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your what? Good works. Good works. And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We're not just saved for ourselves. We're saved for the sake of others. Ultimately also for the glory of God. So go... And let it shine. Amen. Amen.